anybody awake out there? Have enough of that coffee? We'll have some more shortly if you need it. Welcome to uh, Friday. You have officially made it through to Friday. Woo! Yeah. Hope you all have been having a great conference. We have a few more sessions for you this morning and then our door prizes and we'll all be on our way. And those of us that are on the board will start planning for Wilmington in May. So we hope we see you all there. I want to recognize somebody this morning who has worked in a new role um, on our board for the conference committee, Ray Hall. He's going to come up and introduce our speakers for this morning, but he has been responsible for coordinating all of the speakers for this event and has done a fabulous job. So I think we ought to recognize Ray as he comes up to kick us off this morning. Thank well, thank you. Um, of course, uh, the, the whole board and all the committees work very hard. I just did a very small piece, so you should really thank them as you see them because it's, it's a lot of work, but uh, it's a good time doing it. Um, this morning, we're going to have a little around the state. Um, <clears throat> just a quick mention of uh, the speakers. Um, Joseph Sloop, CIO, um, the GIS Director at, at uh, Matt Forsyth, Bill Decker uh, at Lenora County Public Schools, and Ryan Drawn uh, from Lika Municipalities, and Judy from uh, Association of County Commissioners Wall give you just a brief update to uh, let you know what's going on in those respective areas. We'll kick it off with uh, Joseph. Okay, I'm gonna just roam around because I'm just always hyper and I've been up since five with <clears throat> my two little kids so we we'll just walk around a little bit, make it interesting. I don't have any slides, so just move around a little bit. Um, uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to be part of Nickel Giza as a GIS group. Uh, a lot of you either supervise GIS individuals or are GIS individuals. And so I just personally want to thank all the IT folks who really support us in what we do and help us. Um, I have. I work with a couple different IT groups, and I'm telling you what, they're some of the best in the state, and I appreciate them. And, and I know. This, this group is amazing. Um, some of the things I want to update everyone about, about state-level GIS is um, the statewide imagery program. Most people are familiar with that. You get a new ortho data set. Every four years, that's still going um, very well. Uh, they just completed the Mountain and Piedmont region. So that data set will be delivered early 2015. It will also be available um, for download on the NC1 map site. If you haven't checked that site out, please check it out. There's tons and tons of data sets that are out there for free for download. Great place to go and get uh, geospatial data. Um, the other thing is uh, the state is working really hard with creating a couple of statewide data sets, addressing state, or, uh, street center lines and tax parcels. Um, all of these are huge data sets from, from every county. I mean, that's the backbone of most GIS. and so. As these projects progress, your GIS folks will be getting emails from the state, or possibly you, if you're the representative, asking for data sets. Um, so I'm just asking, please support these projects. Um, they, they are going to be great. Um, they also help with, uh, for example, uh, Forsyth County, we have a couple of fire districts that run into other counties, and so I need center lines from other counties to be able to complete some of the analysis. And so once these things are done, I don't have to make 100 different phone calls and bug people and things like that, I can just go to NC1 map, download these data sets as needed. And they're going to provide, as part of this, um, some tools that will be very beneficial to folks throughout the state. The other very, very important thing is uh, metadata. And I know most GIS people really <laughs> don't like that. It's, it's almost a, a bad word to them. But uh, the state will be voting, the, the uh, GICC Council will be voting this coming Wednesday on a state-level metadata policy. Uh, so I would encourage, if you're over GIS or GIS, please take a look at that. And if you don't just, um, just use that uh, metadata standard, please adopt some metadata standard. Um, geospatial data is being downloaded and asked for more and more. And so it's very important that, that we have that metadata in there to let people know about it, protect us, and, and all the other things that go along with metadata. Um, sorry about that. 
So the other thing is next generation 911. I know most people have heard about that and are interested in that. Uh, the 911 board and the CGIA put out an RFI. Um, they're looking for a technical consultant. And so they've gotten that information back. They're putting together an RFP to be able to hire that individual to help with the next generation 911 project. The other big event coming up for GIS folks, and obviously all IT individuals are invited to this too, is the North Carolina GIS conference in February. Uh, it's gonna be February 25th through 27th, and it will be in Raleigh. Um, so please come on out um, and check out what all your GIS colleagues are doing and, and support them. But once again, I, I appreciate all your support from an IT standpoint and GIS standpoint, so thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Here's Phil Decker from Lenore County. It will take me just a moment to get ready. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. And Joel, we're ready on the slide if you're ready to switch. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about K-12. And a, a big thing that's affecting K-12 is changes to the E-rate program. And I know many of you probably don't know what the E-rate program is, but if you look at your phone bills, you'll see that you pay a USF charge. It's a tax on every phone line. And that little bit of tax is collected all over the United States and pooled into a pot of money that is handed out to school systems to fund connectivity issues. And this year, the FCC, the new chairman, decided he wanted to change that program. And so now we're facing something called E-rate 2.0 which is a major, major change in how E-rate has been structured. And so going forward, there's, some, there's going to be some short-term pain. There's going to be some what were previously called priority one services that are no longer deemed broadband connectivity. Things like website hosting, texting, uh, some data plans, cell, cellular phone data. Those things are not going to be covered going forward. The voice telecommunications, our cell phones that we have and our, our voice over IP systems that we're putting in that we have started putting in because they were affordable due to the fact that E-rate paid a huge percentage of what the school systems had to pay to have these services. And I already mentioned the uh, cellular data. They're narrowing that focus down. So the fact that I have cellular data on my cell phone today, and I have cellular data on my iPad today, those things are being phased out. And as that happens, school systems will have to make a decision on whether they can continue to fund and finance those things. But the reason for this, the long-term gain in what they hope to achieve is greater broadband accessibility for schools. What has happened in the past is they had this thing called a two in five rule, where you couldn't get money for internal connections, but two out of every five years. And because there wasn't enough money to go around, you had to be something called a 90% discount school, which meant that 76% of your students were eligible for free and reduced lunch. And if you had that many, in other words, you were a high poverty school, then you were considered a 90% school. And the 90% schools were the only ones that were funded. That money came out first. Well, they still didn't have enough money collected to fund everybody. So for the last two years, no school system in the United States has received any discount money for doing internal connections. And that is creating a problem with being able to serve all the students with all of the one-to-one -one programs that are being in implemented. So what they have decided to do if they have decided to use 
pretty much all of the money to fund the connectivity and the infrastructure. So they're targeting $1 billion annually for Wi-Fi equipment in schools. The funding is going to be handed out according to a national formula where it will be based on $150 per student. If you have less, 60 students or less, then it's going to be done by the school building, an amount of $9,200. The FCC is projecting that it will take $5 billion over five years to fund all of the applicants' Wi-Fi projects. That probably is not going to be enough money, but that's what they're projecting. They are also streamlining the application process and some of the procedures that we have to follow to, to make application for this funding. They have three goals in mind. The first one is internet connectivity. If you look at some of these numbers, you may think that they're pretty staggering when you think about what you have in your shop. Internet access of at least 100 megabits per second per 1,000 students. So in our school system, we have just over 9,000 students. That's 900 megabits per second internet connectivity to the school system. Right now, Lenore County Schools is at 250 megabits per second. The long-term goal is one gigabit access per 1,000 students. So then we will be talking about nine gigabits long-term. Internet connectivity coming into our school system. So the, the numbers are sort of ast astronomical and they look big and you know I know a lot of you may have 50 megabit connections or 100 or, or maybe 200 or maybe more into your local government. These are staggering numbers that they're talking about, the long-term goals. And libraries, most of you have libraries in your counties and I don't know if the libraries fall under you as a local government or if they're uh, self-standing but libraries also qualify for this funding, and they have to make application too. And those goals are 100 megabits for libraries that serve less than 50,000, or a gigabit for libraries that serve 50,000 patrons or more. Then there are WAN connectivity goals, the connections between the buildings. And you'll notice that there's data service scalable to 10 gigabits per 1,000 users. Now again, when you say, nine times 1,000, that's 90 gigabits WAN connectivity. And the FCC assumes that if you've got a fiber connection, which our schools have fiber, they're all connected by fiber, that you can easily scale that up to 10 gigabits. We do have one gig circuits now. But 90 gig, what, how much is it gonna cost for the equipment to have that? And then on your libraries, if they're connected by WAN, they also will be measured and they need to have scalable service up to 10 gigabits. They have no short-term WAN connectivity goals. These are all long-range plans that they are looking at ways of funding. And then the internal connections. If you get that connection to the school, <clears throat> you have to get it into the classroom. Well, it's kind of interesting that they've set no goals for that at this time. They're going to be surveying schools and determining the sufficiency of their land WAN connectivity. And I can tell you from experience that as we move to a one-to-one -one project and we're talking about having 25 to 30 devices that we own in a classroom and then the students bring their cell phones in, you're looking at 60 to 70 devices. And we're in the process of putting access points in every single classroom. But our infrastructure is 10100. And that's not good enough. We need gigabit connectivity to every one of those access points. And when you talk about 802.11ac, you may need two gigabit connectivity, two one gigabit LAN connections to each access point. There are changes in the discount calculation, which determines how much money you're reimbursed. It used to be that you could do schools individually, and if you had five 90% schools, you could make an application just for those five schools. Well, going forward, it has to be done district-wide. And one of the most interesting things, I think, that's happening is that if you have library, your library system has to use your school system discount rate. And based on where your main office of your library is, that's what determines what school system discount percentage they use. 
There's also changes in the rural and urban classification. A lot more of North Carolina schools were considered rural, but now they're changing the way that's calculated and some are gonna be in something called an urban cell and it's gonna change the discount that you qualify for. You used to be able to do income surveys and when you took that survey, you could project based on the number of surveys that were returned, how many students qualified for free and reduced lunch. You can't do any projections anymore. Whatever surveys are turned in, you have to use those numbers. So if you collect 500 surveys and 70% uh, of the surveys are returned, you're not able to project that over the whole school. So that may cause a drop in the discount percentage. And then there's something called the community eligibility provision. And with that, it, and Lenore County actually qualifies for that, and so that's what we're gonna use. If you are a high poverty county, and at least 40% of your students are high poverty, and you serve breakfast and lunch, you offer it to all the students, then you qualify for this community eligibility provision and it gives you a little bit higher discount rate because there's a multiplier that you use. So the main changes, the priority one, which used to be all the telecommunications, that was your phone service, your cell phone data, cell phone plans, internet connectivity. They're changing the name of that and calling it category one instead of priority one. Why? I don't know. There are new, newly ineligible services. They are phasing out voice services over the next five years. So five years from now, no cell phone plans, no VoIP, none of that's gonna be covered. Wireless data plans are going away. There is a bidding exception for certain bundled internet service, but that service level is way below what we use in the school system, so I don't see how that's gonna benefit. And you cannot bundle end user equipment. There were cell phone companies that said they bundled their cell phones with the plan and you didn't have to pay for them. The FCC says no, can't do that. The priority two changes, it's now called category two. The national funding amounts that I mentioned, the $150 per student, the discount matrix change where there are no longer 90% schools, the highest discount rate is gonna be 85%. And what that means, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, if I pay my phone bill, my, my internet connectivity bill, and I'm an 85% discount, I only pay 15% of the bill. The Universal Service Fund pays the other 85%. There are changes in the equipment that's eligible. And, and this next thing here is kind of strange. You can start installing equipment April 1st for the funding year that starts July 1 after April 1st but you don't know if you're gonna receive that funding. So you'd be, you know, you'd be jumping out on a limb if you went ahead and put in you know, a, a million dollars worth of equipment and didn't know yet if it was gonna be funded. So that, that's kind of a strange thing. The next thing is preferred master contracts. The FCC has decided that they can do a master contract nationwide and if they sign that contract, you have to use it for your equipment. One of the things that we liked out of this is technology plans are no longer required. It used to be you had to file a technology plan every single year in order to receive funding. And then they dropped the requirement for the telecommunications part of that and you only had to do it for connectivity things like switches. Well now there's no technology plan required at all. One thing that we do like is that starting in 2016 you can submit something called a build entity application for reimbursement directly to the Universal Service Administration Company, and I'm gonna call them USAC after this. They used to send the reimbursement check to the vendor, and then the vendor had 30 days to send you your refund check. Well, now those checks can come directly back to the school system starting in 2016, but you will have to set up the capability of having electronic funds transfer in order to receive those. The payments will be made only to the schools, and. A lot of people have used consultants in the past. Lenore County used to use a consultant. We don't anymore. I file those forms now. Uh, I learned how to do that without paying somebody five to 10% of the money we were receiving. So Lenore County schools save 45 to $50,000 a year by me filing the forms myself. I'm not an expert. By no means think that I'm an expert on E-rate, because I'm not. But we do have folks in place 
at the state level. There's one for the eastern region and one for the western region of the state. An E-rate consultant that the DPI pays for. Uh, the one for the eastern part of the state is called Janine Hurley. We don't know yet if it's going to be an option or a requirement to have that direct payment. There's still a lot of unknowns. The thing that we dislike the most about this process is this next requirement. Document retention. It used to be we had to keep those documents for five years. FCC's decided we need to keep them for 10 years now. And you have to keep it for 10 years after the last date of delivery of the service. So if you've got a multi-year contract, and I have a couple of those, five-year contracts that I signed in 2011, they expire in 2016, I'm going to have to keep those documents to 2026 now, where before it was just a five-year requirement. So if you know the folks in your school system and those that are school system that are here, you need to amend your document retention policies to make sure you're meeting that 10-year requirement. You also need to alert your finance departments that they're going to have to keep up with accounts payable and invoices that they pay for 10 years. And your child nutrition department, which is where you get your numbers for your free and reduced lunch, they're going to have to keep their records longer than the three-year requirement that the USDA has. And you, you can store things electronically. And that's the end of my presentation. If you have questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you, but probably not. So you, okay, good morning. Um, first of all, I want to talk to you about some things that are happening at the state level that I think affects everyone in the room. If unless you are live, have been living under a rock and missed the election, you know that North Carolina Senate race took national precedence. There was a lot of down ticket activity that occurred because the turnout was so high during this midterm election. So you, you've heard Tom tell us one, the, the US Senate race, on the House side, the Republicans picked up three seats, so it's actually a 10 to three contingency they're sitting to the national level. At the state level, you can see here on the, on the chart, there was actually a net three decrease on the Republican side. However, they maintain a supermajority in the House, the North Carolina House. Also, on the Senate side, uh, it's I think 34 to 16 majority for the Republicans. So what that means is, since 2012, there's been a uh, Republican majority in the House, Republican majority in the Senate, as well as a Republican governor. So these are veto-proof uh, majorities in both the House and the Senate. So why that is important is because the General Assembly lawmakers in North Carolina um, are going to be continuing the actions and motions of the bills that they have been pushing through uh, without a lot of opposition. So some of these bills are good for local government, and some of those aren't so good for local government. So just to recap of the 2014 General Assembly session, um, just by the numbers, they met 60 days, 2,100 bills, a little over 2,100 bills were filed over the two-year period, 468 bills lobbied. Of those, 117 bills passed of this year alone in 2014, what was deemed a short session, but lasted on through the summer. Uh, normally pass. That usually ends when the budget's passed, but it, it, it stayed in session. Six bills and resolutions given final approval in the final five days of the session. Only one of those was vetoed by McCrory, which was overridden. Uh, zero vetoes, you can see, overturned by the legislatures. I'm sorry, that was none turned over by the legislators. So that one, it was actually the unemployment bill uh, that McCrory vetoed. Uh, and then four bills used as vehicles for major regulatory reform packages. So just some of the things that are happening right now before the session comes back in, some of the considerations. And what I wanted to do, normally when I give this update, I pull out kind of the IT specific items because that's what means most for us day in and day out. But I thought I would include some of the things that affect basically the state as a whole here. Some of those are IT specific, some aren't. 
but you can kind of see how the brush is being painted for the priorities at the state level. So one of the things that's being considered right now, you know if you live in North Carolina, we pay a very high gas tax compared to a lot of other states. Some of those fees go to support uh, billboards and maintenance that DOT uses for supporting those billboards. So one of the things that's being considered right now is adjusting that subsidy from taxpayer dollars for going towards those fees and actually increasing the fees for the developers and the private sector firms that are advertising. So that's one of the items that's being considered and talked about right now. And then also, here are some of the goals that we, as the North Carolina League of Municipalities, adopt every two years as goals for our municipal members. And the county association, and Judy will talk in a few minutes, they have a very similar process. And just to take a few minutes to show you how that works, we have an advocacy goals conference. We have it every two years, and it's in December, so it's coming up in just about three or four weeks. But every city sends a delegate to our, it's optional, they can attend, but every city has one vote to vote on a priority of issues to take to the state. So of those that were set back in 2012, and this lists some of the goals that we have achieved over the last two year period, I wanted to highlight a few of those. So one of those goals that we had chosen, or the membership you had chosen to a lobby on your behalf was to minimize the impact of pension spiking on the local government retirement system. So if you've heard some of the stories of people that have switched jobs or moved around to drive up their salary right before they retire, that's maybe good for that individual, but as it looks for the solvency of the retirement pool that many of us participate in, that's never good business. So uh, it's one of the goals that we wanted to do to put in some measures to prevent that pension spiking from occurring so that it protects the pool at large. Also, there was a lot of goals around environmental issues, use, using the reclaimed water for water supplies. Uh, that was in, included in passage Senate Bill 163, so that allows more usage of reclaimed water in your jurisdiction. Another goal was seeking the flexibility in regarding the impaired water listing. So it gives a lot more flexibility for the local governments of how they treat their development plans and using wastewater and stormwater. Protecting the local power to regulate hydraulic fracturing, commonly referred to as fracking. It's been a hot topic item. Uh, passage of Senate Bill 786 was the Energy Modernization Act. So it passes the control and preserves a lot of that at the local level. So uh, that was that was an achievement for 2014. A goal of requiring moped on owners to register their vehicles. So you've seen a lot of those on the on the streets. Having some sort of oversight of requiring individuals to do the registration. So you can see in House Bill 1145 uh, now requires owners of mopeds to register register those. Then also called for a study to actually require having insurance. So that has not happened yet, but at least the study for uh, requiring insurance for individuals using riding mopeds on city streets or state streets. Seeking flexible water policies in the triennial review. So again, another environmental management commission of setting the rulemaking packages that allows for the water quality standards to be preserved for citizens at the local level. Also, I wanted to highlight a few North Carolina issues and laws that made news either regionally in the southeast or nationally. So uh, one of the big things that occurred in the 2014 session was the omnibus tax law change. And in the presentation I did in the spring and then last fall, we talked about one of the major inhibitors for municipal local government was the loss of the privilege tax. So many cities would issue a privileged license tax for businesses to operate and conduct business inside of your jurisdiction. So that was essentially pulled back off the books and there was a formula set for capping it at a mandated level. Part of that measure include repealing it entirely July 1st, 2015. What this means ultimately is this, re this is revenue that would normally go back to your cities if you use privilege tax or incurred a privilege tax for business owners. And that would be your mom and shop, you know, donut shops, all the way up to the big boxes, the Walmarts, Kmart. So a lot of this is substantial revenue that could be lost at the local level. level. So we were not happy this, this law passed. Uh, the governor has promised to look at how that revenue can be supplanted 
but that's all we have right now. So our mission as cities, counties, North Carolina, is to, mainly on the city side, is to hold the governor to his word and find a solution to replant those, those lost revenues. You can see there, there's a little snapshot from Fox News on the second one there, Senate Bill 729, the coal ash management. Many of you have heard about the coal ash issues. Um, that is Senate Bill 729, clarified some of those groundwater rules in the wastewater system. So that bill was ratified, still some work going on uh, in that area. House Bill 369, criminal law changes. So many of you have heard about the E-Verify requirement. So there was some stipulations in there about small contractors and putting some undue burden. So this was a bill that we think is good. It was ratified that takes a little bit of that uh, burden off of managing small contractors and certain purchases. Regulatory Reform Act 2014, Senate Bill 734 was repealed the de facto moratorium on environmental ordinances. Won't spend much time on that. That's more on the environmental side. House Bill 1099, Joseph talked about GIS earlier. And this is one of the things, I sit on the GICC council that had a lot of concern at the council level because in some of these bills that are trying to regulate drones and unmanned aircraft, the language was so severe that it was prohibiting any dissemination of or collection of ortho imagery by equipment and was holding it basically as uh, it could not be used for public records uh, usage. So. Um, a lot of those things kind of started as conversations. They got into committees. We were very worried and were hearing about the tone of the conversation. So a lot of that didn't materialize, thankfully. Uh, but you can at least see that there's some regulations putting in place for public agencies using drones. And the league, we also are an insurance company. So we are looking at liability insurance for cities that may be using drones, aircraft to inspect water towers and other things, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's certainly some liability concerns with that, so I uh, expect a lot more news and announcements coming into that area. House Bill 133, uh, certainly a very, very bad precedent-setting law that took place of stripping the authority for the Charlotte Douglas Airport away from the city of Charlotte. Um, that's uh, one of the things that we're going to continue to monitor and, and look. Uh, I don't know that it could be reversed, but it's certainly a bad news for cities in North Carolina when that was uh, one of those items that was an investment management uh, revenue loss for the city of Charlotte. House Bill 1145, again, this is, again, making the news. So I talked about this earlier, about the registration for mopeds. Uh, House Bill 1191, the authority to adopt local ordinances, this failed, uh, which was great. This would have removed your city's ability to enforce ordinances on trees. So um, if you wanted to preserve trees or have an ordinance regarding that, it basically stripped that away from the local authority. Uh, and it kind of underscores the tone that's being set at the state level that the state can manage your city better than your local officials can. So uh, thankfully this, this law failed. Senate Bill 865, uh, again, this bill has become law. This is on kind of similar to the Charlotte Douglas Regional Airport issue. So Town of Boone lost their EG, ETJ authority. So um, that was a regional issue. Um, the legislator in that area that was working that um, did lose the election this fall. So I think the citizens spoke loudly about uh, how that issue occurred. Uh, that's an opinion. All right, so some of these things are defensive wins, so they may have been not anything that resulted in a bill or a law being adopted. However, because they were wins or defeated, those were good. So I talked about the tree ordinances. That one never got off the ground. That's House Bill 1191. Uh, similar with House Bill 150, zoning, design, and aesthetic controls. Um, you can read on the, on the board there, the failure of the Senate to vote on the bill meant the defeat of prohibition on municipal design on aesthetic controls on most one and two family homes. So there's a lot of one and two family homes likely in your cities. So again, this would have taken an issue where the local officials of setting zoning requirements would have been removed. So um, that's, that, that luckily was, was defeated. And then most importantly, uh, we talked a little bit about 911 centers. You've heard me talk about that over the last couple of reports. If you maintain a PSAP, either at the municipal level or at the county level, there's been initiatives about mandating a backup facility and maintaining a backup infrastructure to support data being migrated over to the backup center. 
Uh, good principle, and I think all of us in the IT world agree that having backing up the data is good. However, the funding of that and pushing that down to the local level of mandating you to build the facility without having some other support is something that we're, we haven't worked through. So we're always worried about unfunded mandates. So uh, this is something that uh, did not materialize in the 14th session, but I think we'll be back this year in 2015. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Judy Ryan uh, for a few words. Okay, I know we're into your break time, so I only need about a minute. I just wanted to let you know that the association, which is the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, um, is going through a period of significant change and transition. Our executive director, David Thompson, left a couple weeks ago to accept a position with NACO, which is the National Association of Counties. He's leading their financial services division. And with that, Kevin Leonard, who was our deputy director in charge of leg legislative affairs, has been um, moved into the executor, executive director slot. So, um, David and Kevin, very different individuals. David came from um, the background of a lifelong county manager, strong financial background. Kevin is a lifelong lobbyist. So, um, we are anticipating uh, significant change within our organization. Um, some of which has already started with staff realignments. Um, we promoted um, yesterday, sent out a press release promoting Amy Basin, who was our general counsel. Um, she's now deputy director. She will, of course, continue as general counsel, but will be taking on more day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities and daily operations. Um, and we, we do anticipate further staff realignments in the coming weeks. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Um, I, you know, obviously our mission is always going to be to serve the counties, but exactly how we do that, I'm not sure at this point. But um, as Ryan alluded to in his presentation, we are also in the process of um, establishing our legislative goals. Our legislative goals conference is in January, and this year it's going to be in Pinehurst. Um, all of your commissioners will attend that. For those of you in counties, um, our counties, uh, your commissioners will attend that and decide what our priorities are from a legislative perspective. Um, and um, so if you have, have any key issues there, please talk to your managers and, and uh, Hopefully they'll pass that on to your commissioners. Also, we as an association are revising our strategic goals. We, it's been probably about eight to 10 years since we've done that. Um, our board of directors, which is made up of 48 county commissioners um, across the state will be, well, they have been looking at our strategic goals and we plan to publish those next, next June, I believe. So anyway, we're uh, looking forward to a lot of change in our organization. So if you, as always, if you need anything, um, please feel free to give me a call. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, um, Phil, Ryan, and Judy for coming up. We always need to touch base with the other sister organizations and and make sure that we're keeping in touch with the state and local governments. Uh, we just want to remind everybody we have a break here in just a few minutes before the last general session. You have your programs. We want to take, the, take your programs out, fill out the surveys for us. Jason will be at the back of the room and maybe a few others. Just look for them with the boxes. Fill out the surveys. You'll turn those surveys in, and then you'll also turn your badges in at the same time. That's what we'll draw with is off of our badges, but turn in the survey to receive that. And thank you, and we'll look forward to the general session in just a minute. <laughs> 